three assumptions of the Christian faith. Why is it not a quadlemma? Why is it not a quintilemma? A quadlemma could say God is also all wise. Does not the wisdom of God bring in a completely different component to the paradigmatic problem? And God, the fifth one, God lives in eternity. Does not time play a factor here in understanding pain and suffering? If you take a child, it's about a year old, and you take that child to the doctor, and he's about to get jabbed with big needles. My mother is all loving. My mother has the power to either take me into this building or take me out of this building. <laughs> Why on earth has she taken me into the building where this man is going to jab and hurt me? Takes a few years for the child to find out, ah, now I know. I came, I've come here from Ottawa, Canada, where I spoke at the 50th anniversary of the Canadian Parliamentary Prayer Breakfast, and a fantastic gathering. 50 years it's been going. And the night before, at the di dinner, Dr. Kent Brantley spoke. Some of you may know his name, the doctor who contracted Ebola when he was in Africa. It has been seldom that I've heard such a riveting testimony of the power of God in the life of a totally committed man who understood his calling. He's a physician, and there in just somber tones, yet plain speaking language, told of the horror that struck his body. And as he described it, and all that had to be done to him to put him in, in, in the same, to that protective suit and fly him out from there and bring him to Emory. And all that went on to ultimately rid him of that dreaded disease would have taken, that would have taken his life. What if he were a child and you had to explain all that you were doing to that child? Time becomes a component. Understanding becomes a component. To say there's a trilemma is actually trivializing the problem. It is much more complex than just three propositions from the Christian faith. But here it is. Job struggles, and he begins to complain. And the biggest problem he had right in the beginning was his friends. I would never dream of giving my son the name Eliphaz, Bildad, or Zophar. <laughs> they simply don't look good. And the best thing they did was when they sat silent for a few days, just sitting by his bed. The problem began when they opened their mouths. There's a lot going on here. And that's why he even comments on what kind of miserable comforters are you? You boys are supposed to be my friends. Friends should at least try to defang the pain in some way. So the first one, Eliphaz, the oldest, begins with an incredible story. I don't know which church he went to, but he begins by this. He says, a spirit glided past my face. The hair of my face stood up. As soon as he would have begun like that, if I was sitting on an ash pile, I'd say, please, Lord, help me. Where is this boy going? He first, he, a spirit glided past my face. The hair of my face stood up, and it stood still. But I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. And then I heard a voice. Can mortal man be righteous before God? Can a man be pure before his maker. All right, here's Job. You're, you're sitting head to toe with boils, and I come to you and say, I want to tell you something. A spirit glided past my face. The hair on my body just stood up, you know. There was silence, and he probably was saying, I wish you'd do the same. And then, <clears throat> then the spirit spoke, can a man be pure before his maker? Can a man be righteous before God? Even if it were true, there's a problem here. I remember uh, my professor of uh, the history of Christian thought in my graduate school days. Some of you may, may know the name, but he had seven earned degrees. Three of them were doctorates, uh, Dr. Montgomery. We used to pray before we went to class because he used to give half of the grade for the questions we asked in class. And we'd think up half, sit up half the night thinking up of questions. And uh, then he gave us the exam, and I had a problem. I didn't understand a single of his question. And I kept looking at this saying, what am I going to do? I don't even know what he's asking me for. But the bothersome thing was the guy in the next desk 
was writing away furiously, hardly breathing between sentences and going on and on and on and on. I said, what's the matter? He's writing, taking more sheets, ripping more sheets, filling out. I've yet to comprehend what he's asking me to write about. So on the day when we got our marks back, I wanted to see what he got. And when Dr. Montgomery handed it back, he looked at his sheet of paper. You know, in, in India, when we grew up and we didn't know the answer to something, we'd write as much as we think was possibly remotely connected to the subject. <laughs> and in the volume of words would be some hint in the direction. We used to call it padding, padding, just pad, you know, just say all that you think needs to be said. And somewhere you may say what the professor wants to see. Well, he padded it. And Dr. Montgomery, just in red ink, wrote this one line. This is not right. <laughs> this is not even wrong. <laughs> you see, if you say something is right, you're assuming something's been said. If you say something is wrong, again you're assuming something's been said. When it does not even rise to the dignity of an error, that's when you say, this is not even wrong. <laughs> what do you say to a man like Eliphaz? So Job just comes back and he says this, you know what? A despairing man should have the devotion of his friends. Please don't leave me to suffer like this. And then he says, your speeches are heartless. You would even cast, cast lots upon orphans. All right, if I have sinned, tell me why I'm not being pardoned. I won't argue against it. Why am I being punished? Then he comes out with this line, teach me and I will hold my peace. Lead me to understand. So he's, Eliphaz has done with his speech. And then comes Bildad, he's a little more cruel. He calls Job a windbag. And then he says, inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and apply myself to that which the fathers have searched out. They shall utter words out of the past. Again, it's good counsel, but it's simply not getting to where Job's at. Inquire of the past. Augustine has written on these issues. Luther has written on these issues. So many great thinkers have written on these issues. Inquire of them what it is they really said. Yes. It helps. One of my professors <clears throat> at Trinity was a man by the name of Feinberg, Dr. Feinberg. His master's thesis, his doctoral dissertation was on the problem of evil and the problem of pain. I quoted him in my book. I had no idea what he, following all of that, went through with his family as his wife contracted a most dreaded disease in which gradually you lose all capacity. And then to their horror, they found, find out <clears throat> that it is passed on from generation to generation. And he became terrified about what his children would face. And Dr. Feinberg said, with all of my reading and all of my knowledge and all of my breadth of understanding, when this news came to me, I was floored. I didn't know where to go with it. And that's the reality. You understand that. I understand that. I've been through some of it myself, and every time it happens, I say, this is hard, Lord. I don't know how I'm going to climb this hill. You understand what's going on? I don't. And so, as Bildad says, inquire of the former age, Job's response is this. Look, is his power arbitrary? Does he really, at whim, inflict this stuff? He says, I don't go doubt God's existence. I'm just wondering about his purpose. And then he says, how can I be just before God? He says, why doesn't he just leave me alone? Not bother with me. Why this? And then he comes out with this. Is there an umpire between God and me? somebody who can plead my cause before him. And so Eliphaz's speech ends with Job asking for understanding. 
Now he's coming a little more to a point, he says, I want to know if there's somebody who can stand before God on my behalf and plead my case. Now comes Zophar, the youngest, and he's the rudest. And he goes on to say, you know what, Job? We've really got a problem. It is easier for a, God, for a donkey that to learn wisdom than for us to teach you an idiot. How do we teach you? How are we going to get through to you? And then he says, don't you understand, Job? Your ways are not God's ways. His ways are not yours. Again, it's true. We know that. God's ways are not our ways. Job is just trying to wrestle with purpose, trying to wrestle with representation. And now he comes to a series of questions and he says this. Talk to me, God. What have I done? Is there a clue? And then he comes with this statement to his friends, when you boys die, wisdom is going to die with you. You see what's happened? Those who came to help have suddenly become his tormentors because they are missing something very important. I've learned in years of visiting places where an awful lot of pain is being experienced. You're better off remaining silent and just shedding your tears with that individual than saying something that is going to just hurt even more. <clears throat> In the book, I give this illustration. I've had two major back surgeries. If any one of you has lived with major back issues, you know the kind of pain you can have. And for there were days where even after my surgery, I'd be sitting in my car, going to meet my wife or children for dinner, and I'd be sitting there in a parking spot and lean on the steering wheel and just cry. The pain was so agonizing. I have two titanium rods from L3 to S1, four clamps, eight screws bolting me down. I injured it very badly many, many years ago, and all those years went by with a lot of pain. And as I have struggled with that, I've just found out that sometimes all you really need is a helping arm around your shoulder or something during those days. But here's what I want to tell you. I tell this story in my book. After my back surgery, you know, it's a heavy padding they put on there, and um, I, I couldn't move. For about four days, I couldn't move. Actually, that was the second one because the dura, the lining tore, and uh, trying to mend that was a challenge, and he said, for four days you can't move, you have to lie totally motionless. He says, if you need to turn, we'll send a couple of nurses and they will try to turn you together. So I went and uh, lay down, and about two days go by, and I say, I wish I could just lie on my back for a minute or two, you know. So I called uh, an orderly, he brought another man, and they're very skillfully with a sheet under them. They turned me to my side, all for about two, three minutes, and then I had to come back. Middle of the night, I said, I just have to turn. So I called the nurse, and she said, all right, I'll try and turn you. I said, ma'am, it took two pretty tough guys to do it in the afternoon. Can you bring another nurse to help you? You're going to need two. I don't think you can do it all by yourself. She said, no, 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 I'm very experienced. I said, the way they did it, it needed two of them to hold a sheet, <laughs> you know. She said, you know what, I've been a nurse long enough, so I wasn't going to argue. She rammed her hands underneath my back. I will not tell you the thoughts in my mind, but I will tell you that I screamed. And you know what she said? You've had back surgery. I thought you'd come for a hip replacement. I can't believe this. <laughs> the next day when I told the doctor that, I won't tell you what he said. He stormed out of that room because that place could not be touched. You touch a healing wound in a wrong way, you will do greater damage than any intent you may have had in your heart. And I've come to this conclusion. Be wise in what you say, when you say it. So, Job comes directly to God. 
And out of the silence, God answers him. And God asks him 64 questions back to back, which was the last thing Job wanted. He wanted answers. And God, God says, all right, I'll talk to you now like a man. Where were you when the foundations of the earth were laid? Were you there when all of the boundaries were set? And on and on and on, a series of questions on the intricacy and the fine-tuning and the majesty of this world. Something like the psalmist said, you know, when I look at the world, the heavens and the work of your hands, the, the moon and the stars which you have made, what is there in man that you shall keep him, that you keep him in mind? The whole fascinating world around us. Job, do you really understand all of that? Since you're telling me you will only accept that which you can totally comprehend, let me give you a little test right from the beginning. Tell me how you comprehend this world around you. Do you understand the intricacies of all this? God is opening him up within his own assumptions. When you question a questioner, you determine the entry point of the discussion and you open up the questioner within their own assumptions. That's exactly what God's doing here. Do you really only take all of that which you truly understand? <clears throat> you know, this whole revelation is for God to reveal to Job that he is the creator and the designer. He is the creator and the designer. Now, I understand that in our sophistication with a scientific single vision that we want to give to this world, those are two concepts that are not very popular in the scientific world. Even scientists like uh, Vikramasinghe and Hoyle, when they wrote their book, Evolution from Space, what did they say? Vikramasinghe from Sri Lanka is a Buddhist, which is a non-theistic religion. Sir Frederick Hoyle was a skeptic, an astronomer. Brilliant minds, brilliant minds. <clears throat> they go on to say the mathematical impossibility of just the protein formation is so astronomical that Hoyle says it boils down and Vikramasinghe, a mathematician, says it is so preposterous given the time to think that all this can come together in just in the protein formation, that he would consider it impossible to explain evolution in an earth-bound theory. He's not dispensing with evolution. So what he's saying. He said in an earth-bound theory, there has to be something transcendent from here. That's when they pre-posited the panspermian theory that spores from another planet were brought to seed the earth. Hoyle didn't want to buy that at that time, but Hoyle also accepted it. Francis Crick has accepted it, that spores from another planet. This is the Nobel laureate. He says, maybe in a spaceship or whatever. I, won't even, I, won't, I don't even want to go in that direction. I just want to say to you, we make a mistake when we misposition the idea of evolution as if evolution is pitting itself against creation. It may, it may, and it may not. Evolution to me is a theory of processes. I'm now talking about beginnings. Beginnings. My professor of quantum, John Pokinghorn, at Cambridge University, the, 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 the dean of... Uh, Queen's College, Cambridge. Pokinghorn's a late comer to Christ. In his book, One World, he talks about all the precision required and the contingencies for the early picoseconds of the universe. Here's what he says with just one of them. He said, if you take the expansion and contraction rate, this is one of the issues that, Haw that Hawking wrestles with too. But if you take the early picoseconds of the expansion and contraction rate of the universe, he says the exactitude demanded was so perfect, and the margin of error so small that one slight number off and the universe would have collapsed. He said the exactitude demanded would be like 
taking aim at a one square inch object at the other end of the known universe 20 billion light years away and hitting it bullseye. The RZIM Church Leaders Conference is going to address the most timely challenges Christianity is facing. You can attend here in person or you can register to watch by live stream on RZIM. Org. We have an incredible lineup of speakers, including Ravi Zacharias, Louis Giglio, John Lennox, Crawford Loritz, Michael Ramsden, Abdu Murray, Sam Alberry, and Joe Vitale. So please join us from October 3rd to the 5th. I hope to see you soon. People are interested in having a spiritual life, but treat faith more like an a la carte menu at a restaurant, choosing what they like and dismissing the rest. Cutting through the hype and seduction is the clear voice of author and apologist Ravi Zacharias in his book, Why Jesus? Rediscovering His Truth in an Age of Mass-Marketed Spirituality. Ravi answers the attraction known as the New Spirituality. Billy Graham calls Why Jesus? a powerful defense of how Jesus Christ brings meaning and hope to an individual life. And Charles Swindoll says, I'm not acquainted with a brighter mind or a more relevant and devoted defender of the faith than Ravi Zacharias. Why Jesus is available in bookstores now or online at rzim.org. The purpose of RZIM is to engage meaningfully with the questions and heartfelt issues of our culture. We do that in areas of business, academia, politics, the arts and media. We live in an age of confusion and people from every continent are beginning to wonder whether there are any answers to life's biggest questions. And RZIM consists of over 50 speakers and adjuncts operating in over 20 countries, working at every level to reach those who shape the culture of a country and its future direction with the gospel. In addition to taking the gospel to various arenas of influence, we are also committed to providing a variety of training events in order to meet people where they are and to answer their questions directly. Whether it's engaging young adults and students through Reboot, Remind and Big Deal questions, 